Buckle up as we dive into the diverse and captivating narratives that make our channel an endless wellspring of entertainment. Story 1. Am I the a-hole for leaving my responsibilities on my sister's wedding? My, female, sister got married on Friday. She and I are twins, so we're very close and best friends. She is child-free, and I have two kids, three male and one male. Obviously, she loves her nephews. She never mistreated them, but she is not a person who would accept being a babysitter for a day. She has never offered to help with anything, though it's her choice and I respect it. Not surprisingly, her marriage was child-free even for the family. She asked me to be her M.O.H., and I accepted. M maid of honor. <laughs> I was responsible for a few things at the ceremony and party, nothing complex, but I asked another bridesmaids for help, so she was also on top of everything. My children stayed with my in-laws while my husband and I went to the wedding. About ten minutes before everything started, I was there for two hours, my in-laws called saying that my youngest hit his head while playing with my oldest and that they were taking him to the hospital. I despaired. Even though they said he was conscious, my heart was not at peace nor my husband's. So we decided to go to the hospital. I talked to the bridesmaid and explained everything I had to do. She accepted, and when it was time to talk to my sister, she had a meltdown saying that I couldn't go at the most important moment in her life and I was choosing him instead of her. I got really irritated and said, yes, I chose my son in the hospital. I left with her cursing. My son is fine, but he got two stitches without any internal trauma. They did exams. But we only left the hospital the other day because they preferred to put him under observation because he's very young. I preferred to stay away from my cell phone just like my husband had. When I got home, several calls from different people and I answered when I saw my sisters. She asked before how my son was, and when she learned that it was a minor injury, she started screaming, saying that I abandoned her at the most important moment in her life, and that she was without a family in her own marriage, no parents and grandparents. I left my responsibilities to a person who did everything wrong and caused an embarrassment, and to make matters worse, I didn't even want to show up since my husband couldn't stay in the hospital while I would at least share this moment with her. She called me several names until my husband took the cell phone out of my hand and told her to F off. I really could have at least gone to the party, but I wasn't going to make it knowing my baby is in the hospital. I can't help but feel bad for my sister. Am I the a-hole? No. Your kids come first. And like you said, they were young, they were being rushed to the hospital, they were kept there overnight, and yeah, it turned out to be more of a minor injury, but you didn't know that at the time. You don't, you're not psychic. You couldn't predict that it was going to be a minor injury and therefore stay. And for your sister to throw a fit like that when your child is in the hospital, she needs to get her priorities straight. I understand weddings are important to many people. They, it's a very important day for them. But just because it's your special day, doesn't mean other people stop mattering. And so for her to throw a fit like that and not be understanding is pretty gross. It's not a good look. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry. She owes you an apology and you most certainly do not owe her anything of the sort, you know? I mean, I'm sorry. That's just ridiculous. Story two. Middle-aged Karen parked in the mother's parking spot and confronted me about how I'm not entitled to it? Hey there, this happened yesterday at my local Loblaws. <laughs> Most grocery stores here in Canada have a few expectant mother's parking spaces that are intended for pregnant women or parents with babies to use. They're generally closer to the door, usually beside the handicap spaces or cart corral. I'm currently seven months pregnant and was following a Lexus into the parking lot and I planned to use one of these spaces. The Lexus ahead of me took this space. I didn't think much of it and parked about four to five spaces down from it. As I'm walking into the store, the woman in the Lexus, mid-sixties, saw that I was very visibly pregnant and said, Oh, I'm so sorry I didn't realize, and laughed at me. I'm hormonal and it probably wasn't necessary, but I responded with, you're obviously not that sorry since you parked in a spot you shouldn't have. She proceeded to get about a foot from me and scream at me, F you, you're not entitled to this spot. 
I was caught off guard and started crying. Not proud of this, but the hormones are intense sometimes. Thankfully, bystanders don't like it when people yell and physically intimidate a pregnant lady, and about five people came over to rip her a new one, telling her she's way out of line and I'm the only person they see who's entitled to the space. One gentleman, my hero, actually called her Karen. She got back into her car and left. I just don't understand why she felt the need to confront me. Did she think apologizing for her intentionally crappy behavior would make her look less like a Karen? Like, I wasn't going to say anything. I just assumed she needed it because she had a baby or whatever, but she didn't. So that's my crazy Karen story. Mild compared to most here, but it was honestly scary. Yeah, I've definitely seen folks like this who park in ways that are just, you know, completely disrespectful to everyone else there, be it parking in handicapped spaces when they don't have any stickers and don't need it, uh, or maybe they do. That's not a judgment call I can make from just on site. Um, but, you know, and taking up too many spaces. And for this, I think it's wonderful that there are these spaces for expectant and new mothers. But to take those because it's like, well, I don't see anyone else using it, so I'll take it. And then to only be like, oh, well, sorry, I guess uh, you could have used it, huh? <laughs> like, that's not even really an apology. That's just like, oh, I would only not be a crappy person if I knew someone immediately needed this. As if expectant mothers couldn't come in a few minutes later and might have wanted that spot. You know, it's just, it's just kind of gross behavior. And... Yeah, I'm sorry. The fact that you chose to joke back to this person, and what I would say is, you know, uh, cutting enough, but certainly not worth this woman getting up in your face and screaming with her friggin' I've just eaten lead paint stare, I'm sure. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. Just, I don't understand people like that. Just be a little more considerate. You'll be... Oh my gosh, you have to walk an extra three seconds into the store, but you'll just make everyone happier? Gee, what a what a hard walk that must be. Story 1. Am I the a-hole for telling my sister-in-law that she is overweight and she can deal with the truth? I dislike this woman, so I'm coming here if I should apologize. My brother got married a few years ago to Shelley. She's the type of person who will say something rude and then when someone points it out, tell everyone it is true, so what's the harm? My mother despised her and opted out of most events just to avoid her. I moved back home about a year ago and at the time I thought people were just being rude to her or overblowing the things she says. I was wrong. My first proper introduction to her, she told me my outfit looked bad on me and it wasn't hiding my stomach. I give a present to a birthday party and she tells me I'm cheap. I got a bubble gun for a five-year-old. He loved it. This goes on and on. I talked to my brother and he told me she's autistic and she can't help it. I then talked to her and told her I won't put up with her being rude. Now it's my son's third birthday and I invite the family. I wouldn't have invited her, but I don't want to cause waves. She commented on my house decor and I told her it was rude and to knock it off. I lost it when I gave my son a piece of cake. She commented that I shouldn't give him any since he looked fat. I told her to apologize and she told me it was the truth. I told her that she was overweight, that if she took care of herself more, she wouldn't be fat, that this was the truth and that she is rotten on the inside and her looks were just as bad. She ends up crying and leaving. My brother was peed and I was called some fun names. Everyone is torn as to whether I should apologize or not. <sighs> So, this is a slightly tricky one, as it appears that she is on uh, the, the autism spectrum. And, um, you know, I, I have uh, people in my life, very close family members, who are also on the spectrum. And it, you know, they, they don't necessarily uh, speak in ways that are, you know, in line with normal uh, social cues and norms and stuff like that. But at the same time... Like, there is understanding of things that are going to make other people uncomfortable. And them telling you, like, hey, that's actually kind of, you know, hurtful to hear. I wish you would apologize. And to then just be like, no, it's the truth. Deal with it. it I, I believe that there is a line between, you know, not always understanding when you're speaking without tact and refusing to acknowledge that you have hurt someone with your words. and. 
I don't think that you can just, uh, you know, hide behind, uh, you know, anything at that point. You know, when people plainly communicate how what you've said has been hurtful to them and they just, you know, hunker down and are like, nope, I feel like that's not great. Now, whether or not, you know, calling her out on her physical appearance was necessarily the right course of action, I don't, I don't like to ever condone body shaming anyone for any reason, even as a form of revenge. It just, the moment that we start picking at each other for looks and everything, that's, uh, it's not great because it's, it could potentially hurt other people who hear, there's a whole thing. I'm not going to get into it. So I don't think that it was maybe the best response to that, but I'm also not on her side in this situation. If she's being told that, you know, something that she said was hurtful and she's just like, nope, it's the truth. I, I shouldn't have to apologize. Well, then you're kind of being a crappy person. So yeah, I don't know. That's where I stand on it, but I am, I, I, I'm seriously interested to know what other folks think. So if you got some thoughts, put them in the comments. I do get down there and read those sometimes. Not all the time. There's a lot of them sometimes because you folks are great. <laughs> Story two. Today I effed up by chugging 900 milligrams of caffeine within five minutes. Recently, I've just been insanely bored and tired of my day-to-day -day college life, so I decided haphazardly to lock myself in my room and chug three 300 milligram energy drinks back to back within about four to five minutes. I have no friends at my college and I'm severely behind in my coursework, so every day I feel both completely lonely and severely overwhelmed. Not trying to start a pity party, but I've been feeling pretty bad about myself as of late due to both not having any friends and being accepting of my poor grades. So I see this as kind of a punishment for being such a disappointment to both myself and my family. Anyways, as for the actual F up, as I type this, I can feel the effects starting to kick in. I'm someone who has a high tolerance for caffeine, and it's only been a little while since I finished the third energy drink. So I'm not sure how bad it will get, but as of right now, I can tell that it's not going to go too well. Very fidgety and starting to feel aching on the side of my head. I am, I also am slowly beginning to notice tension in my upper left arm. My heartbeat is a bit faster than normal, but I'm sure it will get much faster with some time. It's almost as if I can feel the heat of my blood going through the back of my neck, and now it's taking a lot of concentration to stop my right leg from moving up and down. I planned on having a 1200 milligram intake at once, but my body just would not let me drink the last can, so I threw it away instead. I'm still not exactly sure why I did any of this, but with any luck, I'll just have some time to feel something other than disappointment, even if it is bodily discomfort. Huzzah! Too long didn't read. Depressed? A college kid with zero friends and a shaky future intakes 900 milligrams of caffeine via energy drink all at once because of boredom and loneliness. Ugh. <sighs> Okay, I don't even actually want to joke about this one because this is very much a cry for help. Um, I don't know if 900 milligrams is going to be dangerous or not, but it potentially could. That seems like just way too much to be having all at once. Don't do something like this, folks. Um, you're at the very best going to feel like absolute garbage. Um, for this person, I would say seriously consider getting some help. Um, if you're feeling like this, if you've struggled to make any kind of friends and your grades are struggling in college, I know that taking a break from college almost seems like, you know, uh, I'm trying to find the right word for it here, but it, it feels like almost giving up. Like, nope, if you take a break from college, it's just over. You're never going to get that back. That is not true. You absolutely can. And if you're feeling like this and your grades are starting to slip, it's probably not going to get better by just, you know, beating your head against a metaphorical wall. It sounds like you need to maybe reprioritize some stuff in your life. Take some time off from college. Maybe get some therapy or something like that. Try and find friend groups and interests that you can interact with because just trying to push through this is going to be a miserable experience. And it, it, there are people out there that I'm sure would love to be your friends, and I don't know why you haven't made any. Um, I don't know if it's because you're not putting yourself out there, or you're nervous, or just hold up all the time trying to do work and depressed. 
there, there's no way to know from even, you know, if you had written ten times as much, I couldn't say anything for sure, probably. Re really would help to have, like, a third-party mediator, a therapist, someone unbiased who can maybe help you with some of these issues. And chances are, if you start having friends and you're happier, you'll probably also start doing better when you go back to college. But I, I wouldn't stay there if it is making you this miserable. Believe me, it's okay to take a break and sort things out. And sometimes that's for the best. I've known people who didn't go back to college until they were almost 30, but now their life is amazing because they took that time. So, yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that. I've talked too long already. Story 1. Am I the a-hole for making my daughter leave because my husband is attracted to her? I, 55 female, have been married to my husband and my daughter's stepdad, 63 male, for four years. My 23-year-old daughter and I have a complicated relationship. She has been diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder. She has a lot of trauma from watching me and my husband's horrible marriage go down and was bullied in school. When she told me she was being bullied by peers, my view that old children are innocent really tied my hands because I told her that if I said anything to them, I would be an adult harassing a child. She has blamed me for that ever since, and keeps referring to this one time where the kids at school called her trash due to the fact that she wasn't taking care of her hygiene due to depression. Part, not all, of my responsibility was telling her to take a shower, and I bought her new clothes. The bullying finally ended with an expulsion and a suspension for the ringleaders. She still throws the fact that a school clinic volunteer told her that if she was their kid, she'd have permission to punch back if administration didn't do anything. I thought that having her live with me while she finishes school and gets a job would help heal some childhood wounds if my second husband and I modeled a healthy relationship. However, my daughter now doesn't get along with my husband. She is a very introverted, creative person who likes immersing herself in escapism. So she'd get annoyed if she was sitting eating alone and my husband would sit across from her and eat saying she ate later so she could eat alone. However, my husband started acting distant from me, and my daughter complained that his eyes lingered for too long. She got very angry, and there was a lot of shouting and slamming of doors. Finally, my husband admitted he's attracted to her, and it's hard to be around her all day. Said she was walking temptation, and said that's why he was avoiding intercourse with me. I was so upset to hear this. I don't blame my daughter for this, but at the same time, the situation has become unbearable. Something would have to give, and I couldn't collect my thoughts with both of them still being in the house. So I gave my daughter money to stay at an extended stay hotel and asked her to utilize her college's emergency financial and housing resources they have for students in need. She responded by storming out and telling my ex, who is now circling social media, using it to paint me as the villain of all villains. I'm not abandoning my daughter. She qualifies for those resources anyway since my ex is unemployed and we are in substantial debt. I just need time to process the situation and don't want to leave my house to stay with my daughter when I have a marriage to figure out whether or not to save. Am I the a-hole? I don't feel qualified in any respect to try and tackle this. I just... This is so much! Like, A, I just, okay, we'll start at the beginning. A, your daughter is struggling uh, with uh, some emotional trauma that's developed into uh, certain things that a therapist should be helping her with. And the fact that, like, she's struggling with other students and you're like, oh, all kids are innocent, I can't say anything, or it'll be, I don't know about that. That, is that a, is that a thing? I feel like. Man, if someone was, like, bullying my kid if I had one, I'd be like, you better watch it, Jimmy. I don't know. Um, and I mean, it, and it's not to say it's terrible if you did make some mistakes parenting. I think all parents do, and it's totally fine to own up to that if that's part of what happened. And, I mean, clearly I think this person did, to some extent, talking about their previous marriage. But then, let's just get on. The new husband, the stepdad, who's like, she's too hot. What can I do? I can't help it. She's walking temptation. Gross, 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 gross. So freaking gross. Like, 
That's no, that's not a thing. That should be nothing. That just. He's 60 something. She's in her 20s. Stop it, you creepy old gross guy. I'm sorry, lady. I know that you're saying that you need to figure out whether or not you're going to save this relationship. I don't think you should, but I mean, it's your call to make. You know it better than I do, but. Well, and telling your daughter to use those resources when she's clearly been struggling with stuff and is still trying to get her life together. I don't know. I know she qualifies for it, but maybe she still needs you. Maybe there's, I don't know. I, there's a lot going on here, but I would be more focused on my kid and helping them with some issues that I maybe didn't do the best job in their earlier years with. I would want to focus more on them than the creepy guy I married who's like, I can't help it. There's a 20 year old. I can't, I can't do intercourse with you when there's a 20 year old around. I mean, well, no, gross. Get rid of him. Absolutely gross. Story two, cheat on me. I'll steal back from you. This happened to me many years ago. I had a live-in girlfriend and partner before my marriage and divorce. We were in our early to mid-twenties. We had our own accounts individually, and we had one joint bank account. That ex of mine had started taking several girls' trips after a couple of years of our live-in relationship, even though our intercourse life was quite healthy. I started having my suspicions when she asked me to not drop her to the airport anymore as she was going in with her friends. The biggest suspicion came when she requested I not drop her off even to the friend's place that she was going to catch the taxi to the airport from. That was, what was worse was she was always withdrew a fixed and a decently large sum of money from the joint account each time before the girl's trip. One day I happened to catch her on her phone talking to what I can only imagine was a guy, completely unaware that her voice was carrying. I went into her email, yes, she has a poorly chosen password. I found some explicit pics of her sent to a guy. Fast forward to the day of her trip. She goes in for a shower, I take her wallet out, take out all the credit cards we jointly owned, emptied the envelope of cash, replaced it with a printout of the email with the photo, and write goodbye and good riddance on the back and put the envelope back in. Don't say a word to her and put the envelope of cash and wallet back in. After she leaves, I withdraw money she had taken for her girl's trip from the various credit cards. Suffice it to say, I got some angry phone calls from her trip, which I promptly sent to voicemail. Used the weekend to move out of the apartment we lived in, thankfully it was in her name, left her some cash for the remainder of the month as rent and goodbye note. You cheat on me, I'll get at least my money back. So, A, yeah, if she's going to cheat like that, um, I think that you getting that money back and leaving her that little note just to mess with her a bit, I don't think that that's necessarily bad. I do always get skeezed out when couples are breaking into each other's phones and emails. Like, that just, that leaves a bad taste in my mouth, and it always, it at least indicates to me that it's like, this was not the healthiest relationship to begin with. It's like, it sounds like there are some problems here. And we're only hearing one side story. Like, we don't know what this person was necessarily like, but it still doesn't justify cheating. If, the, if your partner is a bad partner and you're not happy with them, you talk to them and maybe break up and then go be with someone else. You don't cheat. It's just dumb. Um, but. Yeah. Otherwise, like, yeah, I'm sorry. If she's like taking money and going on these trips and it seems like uh, pretty suspicious and stuff and you've got your proof. Yeah, I don't. I'm always a little flabbergasted because in these stories, when these people pull off these semi elaborate revenge schemes on cheaters. A lot of these cheaters are always like angry phone calls or yelling at them like, how could you do this? Shame on you. And it's like, you just got caught cheating. Like, your response to them is to be like, okay, I'm so sorry I effed up, but you can't leave me stranded here without money. Come on. Like, but no, it's just angry like, ah, I'm going to get you. <laughs> oh, won't understand that mindset. You can't make me. <laughs> Story one. 
Am I the a-hole for breaking up with my girlfriend because she imitated my dead wife? I, 35 male, was married to Laura for seven years. We have a son who is 10 now. She was the light of my life. When we were both 28, we found out she had a rare form of cancer. She passed away five months later. This crushed me, and I was left drowning in my grief for a long time afterwards. My son and I have been attending therapy weekly ever since. It's been tough, but I feel like we've made a lot of progress. I didn't feel up to another relationship for a while. I filled my time with hobbies, friends, and spending time with my son and family. Then, a little over a year ago, I met Kayla, 33 female, at a work event. We share a hobby that's pretty niche where I live, so we had a great time chatting about it. Eventually, we began to go out together. She's great, but different from my wife. I love her for who she is as an individual. I was hesitant at first, but after speaking with my therapist, I decided to try for a committed relationship if we took it slow. At first, she was amazing. I told her about my past and that my son came first even before our first official date. She was very compassionate and understanding about everything. After a few months of smooth sailing, I decided to introduce her to my son, and they got along great as well. For the first time after Laura's death, I could start to see a possible future with someone else. Everything started to go downhill around four months ago. She seemed to be a bit more distant than usual, so I sat down with her one night to ask her what was wrong. She teared up a bit and confessed that she felt I had been neglecting her lately. She then said that she feels like I'm using her as some replacement for my dead wife. This came as a total shock. A part of me will always love Laura, but I didn't feel like I was ignoring Kayla or anything. I asked for some specific examples, but she didn't say much afterwards. I felt guilty that I had made her upset, so I ended up apologizing and arranged for us to have a few more date nights, and she seemed happy again. Then a couple weeks later, she had to go to a cousin's wedding. I couldn't attend because of work, but she was only gone for a day. When she got back, I asked for some pictures, but she just said there hadn't been any of her. I thought it was a bit strange, but didn't pry. Then the next day, a coworker of mine showed me one of a private page on Facebook. I was shocked to see an expensive pair of my wife's earrings on Kayla. In my son's room, there's a small cupboard with pictures of him and his mom, letters from her, and some of her prized jewelry. I checked it as soon as I came home, and the earrings were returned to the cupboard, but in a different spot. I confronted her and she got mad, yelling at me for assuming she'd be so careless as to lose or damage the earrings. I told her I was just hurt she'd go behind my back and take something with sentimental value even if they were beautiful. She eventually broke down and apologized, and after a serious talk about boundaries, we moved on. Things improved for a while before her strange behavior started. It began with her changing her hair color to match my wife's. My wife had naturally light blonde hair that a lot of women dye their hair to today, so. While I thought it was strange, I wrote it off as a beauty choice. Then she began regularly straightening her hair. She was wavy hair, and my wife's hair was pinned straight. She also started to change her clothes to be more like my wife's, or at least the ones she's seen in pictures. She also had her ears double pierced and got a tar cartilage piercing, like my wife. This was all incredibly unnerving, but she just said I was crazy. I'd ask my family, and they said I was nuts too, so I ignored it. Then she brought up having my son call her mama. I said I wasn't a huge fan of the idea, but if my son wanted it, I suppose it'd be fine. She went on a whole rant about how it was different because he called my wife mommy, so it's not like she's stealing a title. He said no, and she was a bit cold to both of us for days. She seemed like a different woman than the one I fell in love with. Everyone around me just said I was probably nervous since it was my first relationship after Laura's death. The final straw was when she got a tattoo that was almost the same as my wife's. It was in the same spot, the same color, just with a slightly different design. That was my final straw. I sat her down and confronted her a week ago with everything. At first she denied it all, but then broke down into tears and said I never loved her. She said she felt that she had to live up to the memory of a ghost. This upset me because I had asked her before what I did specifically and she wouldn't discuss it. Plus, she was the one being weird and copying Laura. She kept sobbing and saying I didn't love her. I got so sick of it I yelled at her, saying that if she felt so unloved, we should just break up. I honestly do like her, but I've seen how miserable she's been lately, and I don't think this relationship is good for her mental health. She got dead silent and just left and drove away. I was just so tired of everything. 
Later that night, she tried to commit self-termination with pills and barely survived. She has no living family, so I was listed as her emergency contact. She wrote a long letter to me saying she loves me so much, but obviously I don't feel the same, and that maybe if she was dead, too, I'd love her even a fraction of how much I loved my dead wife. I'm distraught over this. She's been so strange lately, but before all of this, I did love her. My mom and siblings kept on saying that I'm awful for pushing her to this point, and that instead of ending it, I should have doubled down and reassuring my love for her. They all got along great with her and had been hinting that they wanted us to get married so my son would have a mother again, and possibly some siblings. I didn't think I was the a-hole, but my whole family's being cold to me and I have no idea what to do. They're saying I should go visit as soon as possible and support her with this to rekindle our relationship. I'm not sure if I want to do that. She's so unhappy with me and seems obsessed over my dead wife. I keep on thinking over this and wondering if I should have reassured her of my love again or broke up with her in a more tactful way. Am I the a-hole? First off, I do not think that this person is an a-hole. Um, what I do think is that maybe uh, this uh, Kayla that he's uh, started dating or whatever, or been dating, um, just feels a lot of pressure because going into a relationship, someone who lost their spouse due to death and not because it's like, no, things didn't work out between us and we, you know, we weren't getting along and we were unhappy and we weren't in love anymore. It's like, no, he clearly loved his wife a lot and losing her was incredibly hard. That's a lot to live up to. And that's a lot of pressure for a person. Now, I'm not saying she handled it in the right way. It sounds like she might even have some of her own issues, and this just kind of piled onto it. That pressure had her doing things that, you know, she shouldn't have. And I don't necessarily think pushing her away was the right choice. I think, you know, boy, I'm a broken record about it, but therapy. Like, there's some serious issues going on, both on the poster side for the trauma of dealing with losing his wife, and for this person trying to live up to this deceased wife in some ways and never feeling like she's good enough. She might be great, but this is just that one issue that she is not handling well at all. And you might think you're reassuring her, but maybe doing things that you don't realize or just things that she's interpreting wrong or something. Who knows? But I think if you do care about this person, that it would be worth while to enter into like some couples therapy or something, talk things out, get get a unbiased third party that can actually give you some perspective and advice because, you know, it seems like a good relationship otherwise, just, you know, a little troubled. Story two. Today I effed up by unintentionally flashing my sisters. The title is pretty much self-explanatory. Context, yesterday, my husband was coming home from California since he travels back and forth between there and Oklahoma for his job, so I wanted to give him a little surprise for when he came home since he was gone for a few days. Now, the surprise was me pulling a Margot Robbie when she was in Wolf of Wall Street and appearing before him in my birthday suit when he came back home to set the moves so we could do the deed. What I did not know was that he had a little surprise for me, too, in the form of my sisters who came with him from California to visit me since I hadn't seen them in a long, long time. So you can imagine the awkwardness when I walked out into our living room fully nude and the even more awkward silence that followed when I just stood there for like five seconds before heading back to my room to get some clothes on before heading back out to greet them. Needless to say, I'm very happy to see them, but very embarrassed by the miscommunication between me and my husband that led to the situation that happened. You're all adults. They'll get over it. Come on. It's, you know, if, if this is the most embarrassing thing that happens to you your whole life, then count yourself lucky. I, I think it's fine, you know, and I'm sure that they understand too, you know, it's like you're trying to do something from your husband, didn't realize it did not work out okay. Hopefully you'll all have a laugh about it in a year or something like that. I wouldn't let it get you down. I will say, if there is anything that could be used as, like, the ultimate promotion for buying, like, a little video doorbell uh, camera thing, um, this is it. Because you could have been like, oh, is that him coming in the door? Wait, my sisters are there too. I'm going to put a robe on. Like, seriously, I'm telling you, I mean, I know 
you know, people get worried about like, ah, oh, someone's going to steal my information. But what's worse, some big company stealing your video information or your siblings seeing, seeing your peaches and cream, huh? Just saying. Story one. Am I the a-hole for being embarrassed with my cheapskate boyfriend? We've been dating for about four months, and mostly it's been good. He's cute, smart, and very successful. The only downside is that he's almost addicted to buying things that are on sale or have coupons despite being a VP at his company. I'm not talking about sometimes or even most of the time. I would be all right with that. He never buys anything at full price. Never! He plans his cooking around what's on sale that week at the grocery store. All of his clothes were bought on sale or clearance, even his socks and boxers. Last week, we were at my friend's house for dinner, and she commented on his shirt. He proudly said he got it on clearance last year for $20. I was mortified. Lastly, we don't go to any restaurants unless he finds a coupon or they're running some kind of special. Things came to a head last night when we went out to dinner. He had a digital coupon for buy one, get one free. For some reason, the restaurant's computer didn't recognize the deal, and the poor cashier couldn't make it work. We were holding up the crowded line because he refuses to pay for both dinners. Finally, the cashier called the manager, but he was busy somewhere else in the restaurant. While we waited, the people behind us were getting annoyed. I was so embarrassed, I left him standing in line by himself and went to the car. We argued the entire drive home. We were supposed to go to the movies because he got free tickets, but I wasn't in the mood, so he dropped me off. We haven't texted today at all. When I talked to my friends at brunch, they didn't see a problem with it, and I found it frustrating that they didn't understand how embarrassing it is. Am I the a-hole, or is this normal? I would say that in that instance of being kind of embarrassed of him, like, holding up the line and stuff, I could see being a little embarrassed by that. Like, it is the fact that he does make enough money to where that really shouldn't be an issue for him every once in a while. The rest of it, though, like, being embarrassed when he, someone's like, oh, I love that shirt, and he's like, I got it for $20, you know? And you're like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. That's kind of, like, I don't think that's great. Like, okay, so he makes a lot of money, but he's also very frugal, and I don't know, maybe so he can put that money towards other stuff or save it so, like, you all, like, if you got married and stuff, you could retire when you're 50 or something? Doesn't that sound nice? I don't know, like... Let the guy enjoy finding some deals. I love finding deals. I'm always looking to find ways to save money. I also don't make the same amount of money that a VP does or anything like that, but I don't know. I And maybe he also grew up without a lot of money. Like, let me tell you, I came from a household where a lot of times we were scraping by, and trust me, I learned to hunt deals. I feel that sometimes I might even get on uh, Madam Facts uh, you know, make her roll her eyes a little bit with how much I am all about deals. I bought yogurt, like a eight pack of the Chobani, like flip yogurts. It was cookie dough and it was s'mores. And the grocery store had like an eight pack of them on sale for like six bucks because it was expiring in five days. <laughs> She's like, we're going to have to eat a, eat a lot of yogurt. And I'm like, yeah, but it's, it's such a good deal. And I like yogurt, especially the, the cookie dough, the s'mores. Those are like the two best flavors. Come on. I don't know. I get it. I don't think you should be embarrassed about the other stuff. Um, I think that's even maybe a little eh. But in that one situation, like if you can afford it, sometimes just bite the bullet and be like, okay, yeah, I'll just pay full price. Like it. There could be a little give and take on either side, but... Yeah. Story two. Today, I effed up by picking up a hitchhiker and then showing up to my own funeral. This happened a few years ago, and I was living in Zimbabwe at the time, and I was having a pretty bad day. I was going to see my aunt who lived about 400 kilometers away from me. If you're African, you'll understand that this was no small journey. So I got in my car and set off, and about three hours into the journey, I came across a dude by the side of the road who was going in the same direction. So, out of the goodness of my heart, I said, jump in. We went to talk, and he happened to be going to exactly the same village as me, and he knew my auntie. Half an hour passed, and we're making polite chit-chat and reminiscing about old times in Zimbabwe, when all of a sudden, he tells me to pull over, so I do. He runs out of the car and starts making retching noises, so I assume he's throwing up. It's dark at this point, so I can't really see much. So I go to check on him. 
first mistake. I get out and go to his side, expecting him to be there, but he's not. Then I hear someone behind me, and before I know it, I'm unconscious. So I woke up a couple hours later, I know this because the sun was coming up at this point, without my car, clothes, or wallet. So I'm thinking, great. I look around and see I'm on some farmland wearing the guy's clothes. So I start walking in no particular direction and eventually come across a settlement. I explain to them my situation and they tell me that the nearest main road is at least a good half a day's walk from where I am. And they don't get many cars coming through this part, but they heard one last night, which might be our thief. I start walking in the direction they point me in, and after what felt like forever, I come across a road, so I pitch up and start waiting. Now, I know most of you are thinking, why not call someone? I had no phone with me, and I don't have the best memory, so I didn't know my any numbers that would come in handy. After a couple of hours, a car stops and let me hitchhike. Hitchhike. I let him know the situation, and he says we're in the complete opposite direction of my intended destination, but he's willing to drop me close enough to walk the rest of the way to which I thought, great. It takes a good two days to get there, and he drops me off, and I say my goodbyes to my driver. I take down his number so I can repay him later on. At this point, I'm starting to recognize my surroundings. I walk a few miles, and as I'm getting closer to my aunties, I can hear a lot of singing on what appears to be a large crowd, which I thought was strange. I'm about 100 feet from the house, and I see my son, which again I thought was strange because he was meant to be in school at this time. But instead of running to me and hugging me as he normally does, he runs away screaming to my complete bewilderment. I get to the gate, and all of a sudden, a large crowd alerted by my son's screams has stopped singing and is standing silent. My wife appears and starts to run toward me, hugging and kissing me like I've been gone for months. My auntie appears and immediately faints when she sees me. I still have no clue what's going on at this point, and I'm exhausted, so we rush to get my auntie inside and I see my picture on top of a large box that resembles a coffin sitting in the living room. So it turns out that the guy who robbed me and made off with my car, my wallet, and all my clothes was in a car crash so bad that they couldn't identify the body, and because the only thing they could use to identify him was my wallet, they assumed it was me that had died in the crash. Since there was no body of sorts, they could arrange the funeral pretty quickly, and that is what I had stumbled upon. My son still has nightmares to this day, and my wife has told me never to pick up a hitchhiker ever again. You know, I know we always hear horror stories about picking up hitchhikers, and I always struggle with them because I'm like, but someone's in need, I want to help them, and isn't it worth the risk to help your fellow human being out? And I guess maybe not always, but also, karma hit that hitchhiker back. In the worst way, just, I mean, stole a car, steal your life, I don't know, cheesy peach, but the fact that, I mean, now, now, the he now the whole title of this thread makes sense, which I was having a little trouble wrapping my head around at first, but wow, what a, what an, a weird story to be able to tell. I don't know that it's worth what you had to go through, but. Also, that is a story that I imagine very few other people could ever tell in their life to show up at their own funeral and surprise people like that. Like, that's straight out of a movie. So, boy, oh boy, it's a, it's a real thin lining over what was a pretty, pretty stormy cloud. But I guess hang on to that, huh? Story one. Am I the a-hole if I tell my friend her boyfriend is planning to propose? My, 27 female, best friend has been dating her boyfriend, 26 male, for over five years. A while back, he reached out to me to help figure out ring size and the setup so he could make this the most magical day for her. Having known my friend for over 20 plus years, I know exactly how she wants her proposal to go and who she wants to be there, so I relayed all this information to him months ago via texts, and over the phone. I even took the time to covertly find and confirm which ring she would love the most. A little background. My friend is incredibly family and friend oriented, and in the past expressed to me on multiple occasions, especially during holiday season, that in the five years they've been together, he hasn't really made much of an effort to indoctrinate himself into her family or friendships the way she has for his. While I do generally like him, I have always felt that he is incredibly self-serving and self-focused. Recently, through a mutual friend, 
I found out he started a group text between his, emphasis on his, friends and family to set up the time and date of the proposal. He has not only excluded myself, and according to the screenshots I've seen, he is doing everything verbatim I suggested he do, but he has completely excluded her family and other close friends from the event. He is planning on only having his boys and family present for the occasion, and knowing my friend, this would ultimately break her heart not being able to share this moment with her loved ones. I got heated and called him. At first, he was dodging my questions, then just outright said, this is my proposal and I've spent enough money and time to choose how I do it. Just be happy for your friend. It's not like you're not coming to the wedding. This infuriated me, and to make matters worse, I ran into her mom and dad at the grocery store and subtly asked if they knew of any possibility she was getting engaged. They were unaware, and I for a fact, and I know for a fact my friend has told him that he needs to ask her parents for their blessing. She's somewhat traditional. My friend wears her heart on her sleeve, and I can predict how this event will go down when she sees all of his close friends and family and none of hers. Considering her previous sentiments about his lack of interest in her family, she will 100% see this as being hurtful and selfish, and I know she'll cry. To make matters worse, the location of the proposal is a whopping 30 minutes from her parents' home. I don't want to get involved in a fight or reveal the surprise, but on the other hand, I feel I owe it to my lifelong friend to help her avoid being hurt and disappointed, maybe even helping her rethink what her future would look like someone who just doesn't really appreciate what she values in life. So, am I the a-hole if I tell my friend her boyfriend is going to propose? I believe you mean, are you the a-hole if you tell your friend that her ex-boyfriend was going to propose? Because, that, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm jumping. May, th things could absolutely be salvageable. I don't know their relationship. But I will say this boyfriend uh, sounds like an absolute dong. Um, I just, I, I hate him. I really don't like this guy. And like, if I'm just taking what I've learned from this story, that's very telling that he is very concerned about having his friends there. And then when confronted about this, wasn't like, oh, I mean, like they're her friends too, though. I figured, and, and I didn't think her parents would be able to make the drive for this. And I wanted to keep it small. Like, he didn't even have excuses. He's just like, look, you're going to get to be the wedding and I, I did this so I get to decide. Like, he sounds like he sucks. So, yeah, I normally, I, I was very convinced that I was going to go in, by the end of the story, I was going to be like, no, you can't tell her whatever you might think. You got to stay out of it. You know, you'll ruin it. No, it sounds like her boyfriend's going to ruin it and maybe ruin their relationship. and. I think maybe the only way it could potentially be salvaged is if you give your friends a heads up so that she can have a serious talk with him because, oh boy, he, oh boy, he needs a swift kick in the pants. Story two. Today, I effed up by using a nose hair trimmer to manscape my nether regions. As preface to this, today I effed up, I am committing one of the greatest social taboos and revealing a secret that heretofore has been zealously guarded throughout the ages. It is, a, it is a correlate to childbirth in that just as postmenopausal women wouldn't dare tell an expectant mother how truly agonizing childbirth is, no man in his fifties would traumatize a man in his youthful prime with fears of the anatomical horror that is to come. But times have changed and new technology places men in grave danger. So now you must know of this biological atrocity in order that you might avoid my disastrous F-up. Sometime around midlife, men's hair follicles undergo a revolting mutilate mutation. While hair atop one's head thins and drops, new hair grows in places you never imagine. Bristle stiff tufts sprout out and inside of ears and up nostrils. Eyebrows become bushy, unruly, and coarse. Pubic hair turns gray and scraggly, I crap you not. All these hairs grow alarmingly fast and require constant attention lest you become that guy with a bunny paw sticking out of his ear. Their eradication is a battle men wage stoically and silently through the second half of their lives. And, as with any battle, there are casualties. Now on to my Today I effed Up. I found a great nose hair trimmer in the as-advertised-on-TV aisle at CVS. 
It looks like and operates like a miniature hedge trimmer. It's virtually impossible to cut yourself, but mows down the hair. Yesterday I was trimming my ear, nose, and eyebrow hair after a shower. I was so happy with the results that I decided to try it on my pubes, too. It worked great! Soon I had gone a bit overboard and pretty much shaved my balls and the base of the shaft to the skin. I, lo I liked the new look, but my bushy taint was a testicular neck beard that had to go. I positioned a makeup mirror on the bathroom floor and laid down spread eagle knees up so I could see and trim everything where, well, where once just a few wispy hairs prevailed, unbeknownst to me, a virtual forest had arisen. Worst of all, my butthole was sporting Borat mustache butt brows. <laughs> Trusty new nose hair trimmer in hand, I prepared for battle. The butt brows had to go first. I began on the left and quickly decimated the bunghole caterpillar. I moved decisively to the right, prepared to take down butt brow two with one swift stroke close to the skin. However, this was not to be. Instead, my butt hairs wrapped around the trimmer braid like Rapunzel using a superheated curling iron, pulling the device tight against my skin and jamming the blade. The hairs were being ripped from my flesh and the pain was excruciating. No matter how I tried, I couldn't remove the trimmer. Wiggling it tugged the hairs more. Restarting it was a double down that I lost. The hairs were wound even tighter against the blade. I frog walked naked to my bedroom, one hand holding the trimmer tied between my butt cheeks, and searched for my cuticle scissors. No luck. I did, however, find a carpet knife. <laughs> Unbearable pain breeds desperation. Back to the bathroom floor, I tried in vain to cut myself free, nicking the tenderest of flesh twice and drawing the first blood of battle. I was making little progress, and it was time to make the ultimate sacrifice. After a suitable prayer, I gripped tight to the trimmer and committed reverse harikari, Brazilian wax style, ripping off the trimmer blade along with its butt-brown net trap. Blinding pain left me curled, fetal, hyperventilating, while blood slowly trickled down my butt crack. I decided to share my TIFU and expose life's cruel secret in the best interest of mankind that others may avoid falling prey to the technological wonders of as-seen-on-TV hair removal tools. Young men of Reddit, I beg you to heed my warning. Do not go gently into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying. Of the light. Too long didn't read. Used a nose hair trimmer on bunghole brows. Tore myself a new one. Why are some guys so willing to put sharp mechanical things down there? Like, I get it. You know, I've trimmed things up before. I, I've uh, tended to the garden and whatnot. And I've used some trimmers with very good safety blades and using great precaution. But a nose hair trimmer, a nose hair trimmer, like, how is that even effective? I, they're like, kind of like circular with some openings for nose hairs to get in, a little bzzz, like, why would you think that was a good idea? There's, n you couldn't get me, you can barely get me to consider putting one of those up my nose or whatever, let alone, down in the special zone, down in the old tickle taint. No, 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 we don't do that. Folks at home, don't do that. I mean, really, you know, just, just go out and get a Brazilian, guys. If you really want to be that smooth, just go get the Brazilian. There's going to be a professional. They're going to pop, pop, pop. They're going to wop, wop. It's going to hurt for a little bit, but you know what? Mm, shiny smooth. And uh, then the hairs will start to grow back and it will itch like nothing else in this world and it's going to be so uncomfortable, and the itchiness will lead to sweatiness, which is just awful. So maybe, guys, some of those parts that people aren't seeing all that often, maybe just a light trimming up just to keep it from getting too wild, huh? Let me, maybe we just calm down. Maybe we just calm down. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.